Habib looks like he may be looking for a Kimura. He's turning the corner. He's going to get it right here. Michael should tap or he's going to break his arm. He's going to break his arm. Hit his arm over. Kimura obliged the Brazilian and he broke his arm. Broke his arm with a spin around. Oh my God. Pretty much anyone who watches MMA knows what a Kimura is. A joint lock that isolates and hyperextends the shoulder joint. If you're really well informed, then you know it was named after Japanese judoka turned professional wrestler Masahiko Kimura, who beat Helio Gracie by way of the submission in their famed 1951 fighting spectacle. If you're one of the elite minds of our society, you're more familiar with the details surrounding this Kimura vs Gracie super fight. Details which have unfortunately been obfuscated by the mythology surrounding the Gracie family. There was an article published in a well-known smut magazine in 1989 about Horian Gracie which established much of this mythology, and a lot of it continues to be narrated and passed down even today, uncritically and without a proper assessment of the history. Listening to Henry Gracie talk about his grandfather's fight with Kimura, you wonder if he ever questioned some of the words that are coming out of his mouth. Grandmaster Andrew Gracie found out that the best Japanese jiu-jitsu fighter ever, Masahiko Kimura. Kimura was not a jiu-jitsu fighter, he was a judoka. It is important to note that what was exported to South America from Japan, what eventually became BJJ, was not jiu-jitsu, it was judo. Mitsuyo Maeda, a direct student of the founder of Judo, Jigoro Kano, is more or less single-handedly responsible for exporting Judo to the American continent. But at the same time, for some reason, perhaps because he was no longer officially registered with the Kodokan in Japan, he referred to it as Kanoryo Jiu-Jitsu. This is without a doubt the Gracie's influence for calling their own art Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. But now that we're on the topic of Judo, it seems many within the Gracie family are unfamiliar with this most basic of histories. Orion once said in an interview, I have a strong impression about Judo that Judo is a sport where the objective is to throw the opponent on the ground using power. But I think maybe the original art is Jiu Jitsu. In that sense, we were lucky to have been able to come in contact directly with Jiu Jitsu first, rather than Judo. The latter statement is of course false as I just mentioned, but Horion's impressions of Judo are particularly painful to hear. He says Judo is a sport where the objective is to throw the opponent to the ground using power. Jigoro Kano was a very small man. His throwing techniques were all about using your opponent's momentum against him and your own body as a fulcrum to throw him. In this manner, technical refinement could overcome raw size and strength. In other words, the exact opposite of a power move. Kano consolidated the entire philosophy of Judo into one phrase, Serio Kuzenyo no Jita Kyoe efficient use of energy, and mutual welfare and benefit. In fairness to Horion, due to the strict penalties for inactivity or stalling, the sport of Judo today has become more of a strength and conditioning game, and throughout the latter half of the 20th century it had become the realm of Soviet-style power judoka. So in this respect, perhaps his perception of modern Judo was not entirely inaccurate. But it's inconceivable to me that someone so absorbed in martial arts can be so unfamiliar with the principal ideas of Kano the first man to spread Japanese martial arts to the masses. Kimura was so confident of victory, being that he was nearly 80 pounds heavier than my grandfather, he declared in the newspapers that if Andrew Gracie could last for three minutes without giving up, that he should be declared the winner. There is no source for Kimura having said this other than the Gracies themselves. And on the contrary, according to Kimura's accounts, it was Helio and his fans who were taunting him. Kimura writes, When I entered the stadium, I found a coffin. I asked what it was, I was told, this is for Kimura, Helio brought this in. As I approached the ring, raw eggs were thrown at me. And while Kimura did have a weight advantage, it was nowhere near 80 pounds. To give you an idea of how much 80 pounds is, that's the difference between a flyweight and a light heavyweight in MMA. So it's like if Thiago Santos fought against Ray Borg. It's a cartoonish level of disparity. No sane person with a basic idea of how much 80 pounds is would watch this fight and say these men were 80 pounds apart. Neither man was weighed before the fight, so we'll never know for sure. The gap was probably closer to 10 to 15 kilos, or 20 to 35 pounds, based on their respective weigh-ins in previous fights. This whole fixation on the weight difference is a way of distracting from the vast disparity in skill between the two. Kimura got my grandfather and he threw him every which way you can imagine, like a ragdoll. He was just too strong. 
but he couldn't finish my grandfather. He would go for the submission, my grandfather would defend, defend, which was his specialty, survival. The most essential anecdote from Kimura's life is that he would often knock his randori partners unconscious with just his throws. His training partners would repeatedly beg him to not use his favorite technique, Osotogari. Soto Gary, we America's big American! Kimura threw Gracie many, many times, but Gracie remained CTE free. That's because for this match, very soft mats were used to cushion the blow of throws, and thus to neutralize Kimura's judo. Gracie had done the same against another judoka, Yukio Kato. Kato ragdolled Helio against the heavily cushioned surface for over half an hour before getting caught in a choke. Helio wanted the fight to be on the ground. The ground is where he gave most of his attention in training, and indeed the ground is ultimately what would become the focal point of BJJ training as a whole. I'm sure Kimura was a strong man, but he was throwing Helio around like a baseball not because of superior strength, but because of superior training and technique. Kimura trained 9 hours daily. Part of his regimen was to do 1000 push-ups. He perfected his Osotogari by drilling it on a tree trunk, which he would do well into the night. Kimura was on a totally different level. Later in his life, Helio recalled this fight, saying he was like a kid, helpless against Kimura. Helio simply did not give stand-up fighting its due attention or respect. If normal mats had been used, the fight would have ended much quicker. And if Kimura himself is to be believed, he was purposely holding off on the finish to give the Japanese-Brazilian crowd their money's worth. But he couldn't finish my grandfather. Except he did. After dropping Helio with a myriad of throws, Kimura had him in Yoko San Kakujime, and Helio lost consciousness. Helio recalls, I was taken into the ground and I got choked at first. It was difficult to breathe. It seemed I went unconscious, but I was thinking about what to do. If Kimura had continued to choke me, I would have died for sure. Helio Gracie said this in a 1994 interview. Horian, who was sitting next to him, appeared shocked by the revelation, indicating that he himself had never known this. As per the special rules Gracie set up for this match, where the winner was to be decided only by submission or TKO, it should have ended right then and there. But Helio didn't tap, and the fight wasn't stopped. Later, when Kimura had Helio in Udegarami, Helio once again refused to tap. Kimura applied pressure until he heard a snap. Helio still didn't tap. Kimura twisted the arm once again, and once again he heard a snap. Helio did not tap. As Kimura went for a third attempt, Gracie's corner threw in the towel, and the fight was over. I said, Grandpa, what did you think going into the fight? What was your mindset? He said, Henry, I never expected to beat this Japanese champ. I knew he was the best Japanese Jutsu fighter in the world, and if I was going to truly believe in what I do, I had to at least test it against that person given the opportunity. So he knew he was going to lose in front of his whole country, but he still engaged. This is a very dubious statement considering the pre-fight circus with the coffin and all that. And if Helio truly wanted to do this only for the sake of testing his abilities, why would he set up the rules to be so favorable to himself? Overall, it took a lot of guts to do what Helio did. I'm not denying that. Very few people would want to face off against Kimura, regardless of the rule set. He refused to tap in the face of unimaginable pain, which is brave on some level, I suppose. But on the other hand, by not tapping, he didn't concede defeat even after his opponent won multiple times, under the terms Helio himself had defined. Helio acted like your least favorite training partner, the guy who refuses to tap and after you let him go, claims he got out of it himself. The lengths that this family goes to rewrite history is a bit scary. And it's also indicative of a greater problem in their worldview. What makes jiu-jitsu, particularly the Brazilian and the Gracie branches of it, so special is that we can practice at 100% intensity and everyone goes home to all their joints and all their limbs intact. That's very important. That's what makes jiu-jitsu so special. In 1955, Helio fought against Valdemar Santana. The fight lasted 3 hours and 40 minutes before Santana finally knocked Gracie out with a head kick. If you ask anyone familiar with the Gracie hagiography, they'll say that Santana was Gracie's former student. Santana himself denies having ever learned anything from Gracie. As skilled as the Gracies were at fighting, they were much better at self-promotion. And one of the things they were able to do is to spin every defeat as a victory. Thus, the loss to Santana was a victory for Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, because it was through Gracie Jiu-Jitsu that the student overcame the master. Helio considered his fight against Kimura a moral victory because he was able to survive and fight with a warrior spirit. After losing to the Gracie hunter, Kazushi Sakuraba, Henzo called him the Japanese version of the Gracie family. The Japanese version 
of the Gracie family. Basically, if there was ever a way to avoid admitting defeat or somehow classifying the defeat as a victory, the Gracies knew how to do it. I'm not saying they weren't great fighters. I'm just saying maybe we shouldn't believe everything they say. <laughs>